Hey, what's up everybody? It's Lids, and we're back for some more Mardek, and today we are going to head out into town and explore a little bit more and see if we can find our way over to that crash site where the fallen star is. Let's talk to our mom, though. Oh, hey, good morning, dear. You and Dugan are going out on another adventure again, right? Have fun with that, but mind you, don't hurt yourself. Okay, so it is daytime, and that does mean that we have everyone out perusing the town. Well, let's talk. Did you see that weird star that seemed to fall from the sky and into the ground over across the woods? In all my years, I've never seen anything like that before. We're not the only ones that saw it. That much is clear. Let's walk into random shops as little kids. Lads! I know how much you like Social Fox and aspire to be like him and all. So, did you hear about his latest deed? Apparently, he saved Baropolis from a dragon or something. Isn't that amazing? Oh, I love that mighty man. He's so heroic, so manly. I'd love to one day just meet him and marry him and meet him and... Lats, you're, you're still here? <laughs> Go away! Leave me alone to my fantasies for a few moments. Oh yes, you foxy man. Swing that great sword. Okay, perhaps some jokes that uh, flew over Little Lids' head. Hello, Marduk and Dugan. I bet you're going adventuring today again. I never get to go adventuring because me mum won't let me. I'm sorry, dear. <laughs> Random bearded man. Hey, look! I have a beard! You little kitty winks can't grow beards, so I win! Hell yeah! We see the guards once more, Bernardo. Oi! It's like a little boy a semi. Bugger off. Oh, hello there, Sonny. Barracks are no place for children. But go in for all I care. Thank you. Now we can check it out. And we have Jacques, who has a French accent, and I'm going to absolutely butcher this, so I apologize in advance, but I will attempt to do it authentically, or at least as authentically as someone who has never studied any French at all can attempt to make it. Ah, Madek and Dugan, how nice it is to see you this day. And you come at good timing, too, as I have news for you concerning your father. You know something about my dad? Ah, I do not know much, but I heard from one of the soldiers that he was sighted in the north, the frozen northern wastes. This is good. It means he still lives. He seems to be on some kind of epic journey, a quest. And knowing him, he should have finished it soon, and will surely be back in no time. Well, I hope so. We all can hope. Enki was a great man, though he will be back soon, I'm sure of these. And when he returns, I'm sure he will have many gifts to give and tales to tell. Thank you, Shot. So he is the leader of the guard, and here in the barracks, we have a few chests to loot. And what we see here is a potion. We saw this last time, we got some potions previously, but we can determine who gets that potion here based on who we're hovering over. So I'm going to deliberately make it so that we have a bit of a, a mix here where we're splitting those potions between Marduk and Dugan so that in case either one of them finds themselves in a bit of a pinch, they can both heal using that potion. Let's check out this house. And so, I guess I should say this here because we're just wandering around town and talking to people and exploring things, that we will probably be doing close to a 100% here. I hesitate to say absolutely 100% because I can think of a few things down the line that I'm expecting we may end up foregoing, but by and large, almost in its entirety, we'll, we will be playing everything. And this is coming from someone who has spent years, uh, or at least a while back, but years on the game developers' blog and forums and whatnot, talking about things with other people who have played this game for even longer than I have, and also the person who, at one point in time, was top the leaderboard, so I'm looking forward to getting the chance to share some insights with you, and if I haven't convinced you yet that this game is worth exploring, then hopefully I can do so still. Hello, boys. 
Welcome to our humble home. Make yourselves comfortable and stay as long as you like. I'm afraid I don't have anything interesting to say, though. Everyone's talking about some weird star that fell from the sky. Of course, I didn't see it, because apparently I never leave this chair. But that's the other thing about this game, is it is wonderfully self-aware. And some people call it a parody. I think it is, uh, that's maybe a little bit too far to say. I mean, it certainly does have its fair share of, of humor and pokes fun at itself. But I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to go as far as to say parody. Children are so rude these days, walking into people's houses uninvited, all willy-nilly, talking to people who live there no less. Well, I never. Who do you think you are, adventurers or something? Oh, woman, you don't even know. Speaking of adventurers, do all the children talk to strange adults in this little village? Scarper chum. An adventurer like me has nothing to say to you. Back in my day, we didn't have stars falling from the heavens. Lord, no. Stars were much better behaved back in the good old days. Not like these rowdy, rebellious stars you kids look at these days. They'll be the death of us all, I swear. All right, Granny. Your thing. Let's talk to Galavar again. Hello there, lads. May a lord not smite you this day. Can I be of particular assistance? Don't remember if he has anything else to say to us, although apparently he does not. We have, of course, talked to him previously, so I think we're not expecting too much new here, so I'll skip through this a bit. We'll head on out talk to other people who we have not yet seen. Like this gentleman. I'm so middle-aged that I don't care much for falling stars. I just don't get excited like we, like you wee sprogs do, you see? You'll understand when you're older. Sorry? Yes? What do you want, boys? You're after some more sweet, sweet cocoa biscuits. I'm sorry, but I've got none to give you today. Okay. If I were any younger, I'd go and look at where that star landed myself. I just know it's something special. Since me old bones are too feeble, I'd never survive the walk through them woods. You little whippersnappers look rip round to go and explore, though. Tell me all about what you find when you get back. Door thing. Now, if you could maybe not block this door so that we could go through. Thank you very much. Hey, sorry lads, but I can't legally sell you any magic until you're a wee bit older. Come back in a few years, maybe. Ducks. Guess we won't be able to. Let's check out some of the books here, though, because some of them will give us some interesting insights. The Elements. Everything and everyone in the world has an innate affinity to at least one of several magical elements. This is kind of what we were talking about a little bit last time. People and spells are all mono-elemental, and their element determines their power, potential, and in the case of people, their personalities. There are seven known elements divided into three distinct groups. There are the natural elements, which nature is composed largely of. There are the moral elements, which are born from the essence of free will and the spirit of life and choice. There's also the odd spiritual element group, which eludes many thaumaturgical thaumatologists to this day. There are four natural elements, fire, water, air, and earth. Two moral elements, dark and light, and only one known spiritual element, ether. Ether, if I remember correctly, there was a long <laughs> argument on the uh, the game forums as to how you are supposed to pronounce that word. Ether, I don't know. Though ether's existence is largely considered mythical. Fire is the element of energy and devotion, passion and strength. Fire people are strong-willed, opinionated, confident, and powerful. They're driven and strive to achieve goals. They can be stubborn. Water is the element of intellect, of calmness, of beauty. Water people are often laid back and go with the flow. They're often good-looking, intelligent, and perceptive. Many have strong magical power, making them ideal mages or wizards. Air is the element of adventure, wandering, of drifting, of dreaming. Air people are dreamers, but they're floaty and rarely focused on one thing for long. Many travelers, and wanderers, and adventurers are of the air element, living on the edge of the wind. 
Earth is the element of wisdom, common sense, and hardiness. Earth people are usually tough and practical, and most certainly down to Earth. They are wise and understanding, trustworthy, honest, and reliable. They can be extremely devoted to a cause or way of life, and are also good at solving puzzles. Light is the, element, is the elemental epitome of goodness and justice. People with this element will live to do good, helping people whenever they can. They live for others more so than for themselves. They are the most helpful, kind, and caring of elements and often become heroes. Dark is the elemental epitome of evil. Dark people are inherently self-centered and manipulative, often violent. They only do things to benefit themselves and care little for other people. They are the polar opposites of light people. Either is still a mystery, as it occurs so rarely as to be considered almost mythical. Not much is written about it, and what is written is not highly reliable. There are rumors of an eighth element, but it is all they but that is all they are, rumors. It's there's no known evidence to support such claims. Personality traits mentioned for each element in this book are the most common for those elements, but they are by no means the only personalities such people can have. Good aligned dark elemental people are not unheard of. Take the adventurer Bernard Stormkiller, for example. Take note of that name. Being creatures of free will, our destinies are for us to choose, not our inherent elements. So there you go, for example, that's a little bit of insights as to the world in which we find ourselves. Elemental compatibility. Though the elements all exist in a delicate, natural balance, each one has an element that opposes it, an element that it must woefully submit to by the accord of the magical laws of the universe. Fire consumes and feeds on air. Air whittles away and erodes the earth. Earth absorbs water, and water douses flames. Thus, the cycle of the natural elements. The moral elements, being antipodes of one another, polar opposites, oppose each other in a unique way. Light floods, consumes, and thus eradicates the darkness, but in turn, darkness puts out the light. These two elements are both strong and weak against each other simultaneously. Not much is known about the other elements' traits, if indeed they exist at all. Is either strong or weak against anything? We do not know. Though these elemental traits are most often exploited on the battlefield, they can cause influence in day-to-day -day life too. A fire elemental person will inherently, though unwillingly, be more submissive to a water elemental person, and that water person will be more bossy and demanding around fire people, exuding an unwilling and unconscious dominance. Such is nature. Let's try one more here. Elements and breeding. Elemental traits can also come into play when it comes to love and relationships. Your elemental affinity plays a large part in determining who you're attracted to and how well relationships with others will turn out for you. Males being the dominant gender. The game said it, not me. Also like to be the dominant element in relationships. Thus, they are attracted to females of the element they are strong against first and foremost. Females secretly lusting being dominated and ravish. Game said it, not me, are attracted to men of the element superior to themselves. So much matches work rather well. So such matches work rather well. Uh, people of the same element can also work excellently together. Similarity at the most fundamental levels has many times been the cause for great love blossoming and flourishing. Such things have been mentioned apply only to people with natural elements. For people with a moral element, different rules apply. Naturally, there are attracted people, they are attracted to people of the same element as themselves, but also to any and all of the natural elements. Because of this, morally elemental people have more choice when it comes to finding a partner that's right for them. A relationship between the two moral elements, that is, a light and dark couple, cannot work, both emotionally and physically. The two people will never get along or fall in love, and even if they did, a child could never physically be conceived in such a relationship. When a child is born to other couples, however, its element is inherited from its parents. In a dominant element relationship, the child is of the dominant element. In same element relationships, the child is of the element both parents share. In moral natural relationships, the moral element takes dominance. Consider these things when looking for a partner. Asking for someone's element before anything else is a great way of quickly getting an idea of whether anything will happen or not. And that, kids, is how Tinder was started. 
So, we'll carry on and look at what's going on in other areas and talk to more of the people around here. Get a lay of the land. Sorry, lads, but I can't serve miners here. No kitty winks like you shouldn't be interested in booze anyway. It rots your mind. But that doesn't stop them from selling all like got cakes. I sleep on bags of money at night. Me up. All right. <laughs> Seems like he's doing pretty well for himself. So so Fox is hot. I want to marry him when I meet him, and we will have like three babies, and I will call them Corey and Brandon and Jamie Sue. Sweet. All right, you do that. Even though Social Fox doesn't have a beard, he's totally my idol. Did you hear about that one time where he was fighting the octopus of many swords and he got all his limbs chopped off, but grew them back and used the old limbs to bludgeon the octopus to death? How brilliant is that? Yeah, impressive. Hey, little Sprog. Isn't Social Fox, like, totally amazing? I heard that once he was surrounded by like a million monsters, no, a million and five, and he managed to slay them all with his eyes shut using only his leather copies. How amazing is that? And now you understand why Marduk and Dugan, as aspiring adventurers themselves, are so keen on, well, are so, are trying to look up to and become the next social fox, so to speak. It seems that there are more people in this inn than there are houses in the village. What does the mayor do about this? Nothing! The fact that Gosnor doesn't actually have a mayor has nothing to do with it! It needs to grow one! Off, uh, off uh, the mayor tree. Someone needs to plant one of those. Yes! One day. Wasn't that falling star exciting? It's one of the most exciting, thrilling things I ever did see. Why didn't we have a, any Falling Stars at our wedding, love? I would have wanted Falling Stars at my wedding. I didn't know you wanted Falling Stars at our wedding, dearest. Well, I guess you just don't love me after all, then. Sorry! The uniform of the Gosner Guard is really ugly. I mean, ew, that horrible vomit green color is so ten years ago. I went for the retro look. Shut up! Okay, if you say so. I only joined the guard, so then I could get this uniform. Chicks dig a guy in uniform. Like, this one here, I'm totally scoring, and I'm so gonna get some tonight. Not that that's an appropriate thing to say to a child like yourself, Mike. Let's check out this job here. And we actually... Huh. I didn't realize this, but we are actually allowed to speak to the shopkeeper, even though we aren't allowed to speak to any other shopkeepers. I don't think we actually have anything to buy from them, but it just so happens that is theoretically possible. Hey, it's George again. I, uh, I do believe I've forgotten where I live. I can't find my house anywhere. I'm sure I'll find it if I wander around this general area for a while longer, though. Yes, I'm sure things will turn out well. Oh, George. Oh, how the mighty fall. Oh, and here is our father, er, Dugan's father, rather. Hello there, son. Out on an adventure again today, are you? Yes, Dad. I saw this star fall from the sky, so me and Marduk are going to, to look for it. Star, you say? That's the thing that other people saw, too. They say well, everyone's talking about it. If you find it, boys, you'll have to tell me all about it. As it is, though, I can't come see for myself. I have a shop to run. And speaking of which, I have customers to probably attend to. So you, you too. But Dad, you barely ever have customers. Nobody in this little tiny village wants to buy weapons, except us, but we're too young. But someone could come in at any moment. A weary and battle-hardened adventurer just stopping by on one of his mighty quests, and he'll want good weapons and fast, and I'll be here to supply them, and he'll tell his friends, and business will be booming in no time. But Dad, the weapons you sell are here are probably aren't very impressive to big adventurers like Social Fox, and adventurers don't usually have many friends. Sure they do! And they have those... what's some call it? Uh, yes, they have those celebrations following them all around all the time. There's always joy and festivities following close behind them all the time, they say. 
and such festivities are always full of drunk people, and they'll buy anything. Well, maybe you're right. I don't know. Uh, good luck anyways. Now, me and Marduk have to go and, uh, go on an adventure. Yeah, so I'll be back later. Bye, Dad. Okay, boys. Have fun. Thanks, Dugan's Dad. Other shopkeeper? Oi, little kitty winks like you. Lost shouldn't be in here. Get out. Bugger off. That's more what I expected the other shopkeepers to say. However, if we go in here, I think we'll find things are a little bit different. If this person would stand still, Mariador. Another name that's a... Uh, is one that has been debated many times over as to what the correct pronunciation is, so I apologize if uh, my headcanon is technically not correct, but at least past lids, little lids, I guess that's how I had always thought that's how you say it. But anyways, oh, uh, hello there, Marduk and Dugan. Uh, off on a, another adventure again today, are you, eh? Yeah, we're off looking for a fallen star. Oh, excellent! Uh, excellent! I I actually have a, another adventure for you again today. It won't take long. It's sort of a side quest thing. Uh, are you interested? Of course. Of course we are. Brilliant! I knew I could count on you too. Uh, I'm trying to make a, a new invention, you see, but uh, I, I don't have all the parts I need. I, I need some more lead pipes. Uh, about five should do. But the best place to get those is in the sewers, from a few more rats. You know I'm incompetent when it comes to combat of any kind, and I know that you relish it and have fought a few more rats before. So I thought this might be a good chance for you to, to fight for actual reason. Of course, I'll, I'll give you a reward for your efforts, so what do you say? Are you interested? Sure. Well, actually, let's ask what the parts are for. Ah, interested in my inventions, as always, I see. This time I'm working on something that I think will, will revolutionize the way we all live. I'm making a mechanical man. It's like a man, but made out of metal and cogs. It can do anything that a normal man can, like physical labor and combat, but never tires or disobeys. I can s see them being used to make our lives easier b by doing all the labor for us. Wow, well it sounds amazing. I can't wait until it's made. Nor can I, b but of course, b I need your help. S will you retrieve the lead pipes for me? Of course. Marvelous. You just have to go into the sewers and kill a few puma rats. They should drop lead pipes. Come back here when you have five of them. And that we will. Let's take a quick peek at what Mariador has going on here in his workshop. The Adventures of Social Fox, Volume 17. Lo, hear these tales of the grand adventurer Social Fox, the greatest adventurer alive in these days that are now. Of his deeds, many books have been writ. He is such a great guy. There was this one time where he totally slew this mighty dragon. It was a foul, evil, dark beast who had captured a princess, one of the finest in all of the lands, and who only the heroism and only the heroism of Social Fox could save her. We must all sing praises of this great man amongst us, to whom we all owe our lives many times. Okay. Cogs of the Mind. It's a technical book that you'd surely not understand or enjoy reading. An Elementary Treatise on Determinants. It's a book apparently about maths. You don't need to read that. A little too much for us to comprehend. A pile of sketches lie here showing various different designs for clockwork automatons. This is Mariador's workbench, where he built inventions. A spanner is strewn haphazardly on the table, along with a smattering of nuts and bolts. Let's check this out as well. It's a book about engineering, specifically the construction of clockwork automatons. It's expert stuff, well above your comprehension level. 
All right, we're only on like the, the kindergartner level. It's a spanner strewn haphazardly on the table, along with a smattering of nuts and bolts. Okay, so let's head over into the sewers, and this is the area that we were unable to go to last night when George was blocking us, and here we will find ourselves in a totally new area. Let's save. And then, let's explore a little bit here. We could take a quick look at the map to see what this area looks like. And basically, you will see, well, that we've only explored some of this area. These parts here that are darker brown around the border are areas that exist, but we have not yet explored. The blue dots are doors that we can go through. The diamond-shaped thing in the middle you see there is the same crystal that we just used. And that goldish colored dot there that's blinking is a treasure chest. So we definitely want to see if we can get our way all the way over there. And we see up at the top here that there are four chests in this area. So that is the target, the total amount that we could theoretically find here. And that is one of them. Here is a fight against the Fumarats. Unfortunately, we do not have any reactions available to us because those reactions come from our gear. And if you remember in the past when we were the mighty heroes that Marduk and Dugan were imagining. Well, we were kind of loaded with amazing stuff, whereas now we are just little kids who are carrying sticks and using those to fight. So we have our normal attacks. Now we have Imagination, which allows us to strike, which is a fierce attack, more powerful than an average attack, but less accurate. So kind of the, the go big or go home strategy. And the indicator you see here is basically non-elemental or I kind of think of it as physical what the element that this is here it's kind of the the nondescript so that'll be in most cases what we'll have on our default attacks as this is the case here and let's give this one a shot so we have three fumarats here they are looking at having only three life piece now granted we probably don't need to attack with extra damage for that reason but we'll, we'll give it a shot anyway don't have any offensive reactions either, so we can't boost our attack that way. Maybe we'll do a normal attack on Dugan. And we can deal three damage, so that's great. We will take another hit from the rats, but we should, hopefully, if we don't miss, be able to take them out on this round. There we go. Get some experience out of it. We are down from previously level 50 when we were the superheroes. Now all the way to level one, of course as our little kids, that, as the little kids that we are, we did get a lead pipe there and we got some antidote, which is an item that heals us, or rather removes poison if we have it. It doesn't actually directly affect how much life we have, but as we may see soon, there will in fact be some status effects that may plague us if we're not careful. These team rats are quick and there is the poison. They did infect Dugan with the poison. They did not get Marduk, although they tried. So, what we could do here is let's just double check who has the antidote. It is Marduk, so we should probably toss over that antidote to Dugan. And then Dugan will use him offensively and try to take out one of the Fumarets and level up in the process. So if I remember correctly, and unfortunately Dugan has gotten hit there, and gotten poisoned along the way. Everyone gets a little bit of experience when a monster is defeated. However, the person who gets the killing blow gets more experience than the person who does not get the killing blow. And that's why Dugan actually leveled up before Marduk did there, because, well, he got the killing blow first. And there we go. We have taken out all the Fumarats here. We'll see if we get any further lead pipes or antidotes, because we could kind of use those. We did. Good. So what we'll see is, if we continue walking here, Dugan will flash green, which means he's taking a little bit of damage here. So what we ought to do is go to our inventory and let's use this antidote on Dugan right now, which if I remembered how to do it, let's see. That would be ideal. Hold S to split. No, we don't need to do that. So this tiny vial of green liquid can cure most poisons when in imbibed. Unfortunately though, it also tastes like poison itself. Oh well. Okay, now do I remember? There we go. Hmm. Thought I tried to just click on him earlier and it was not successful, but there we go. We see some more chests 
We'll try to make our way over to get some of that loot. And there, now that we have explored more, we can see the way in which we get ourselves to that chest that we saw at the very beginning is by wrapping around this way. So maybe we'll go there first. And you'll see that when we are about to fight these fumarats, there's the, the red exclamation point above our head. And what that means is that we saw some of those earlier when we were the mighty heroes, except they were blue exclamation points. So those will show up every time we are about to have one of these random fights. Another web pipe, great. When it's blue, it means that, like I was demonstrating last time, 74 coins for little kids? Oh man, we're rich. So, if it's blue, it means that if you press Z, you can actually cancel that encounter. You can basically flee before it even happens. But if it's red like this, it means that the enemy is too powerful, and you cannot escape. You have no choice but to fight them. So now, Marduk got poisoned here. Let's take a look and see if we have any antidotes remaining. It doesn't look like we do. So we're in a little bit of trouble in that regard. Let's see if we can take care of these fumer rats quickly. We can, so at least we're minimizing the amount of time in which Marduk gets damaged in battle with the poison. We get seven coins out of that. So theoretically, what we could do is, if we're feeling bold, we could continue looping around this way and get the two treasure chests over here. However, that does mean that along the way, as we were seeing before, Marduk will take a little bit of damage. We'll turn green here. And let's take a look at just how much life he has to see if he's hanging on by a thread. He's still on 56 out of 70 life, so he's doing okay. We could, if we were concerned about him, head our way back to the crystal here, and that would allow us to heal up and remove the poison and also get back to full HP. I don't think we necessarily need to do that right now, but it is a bit of a risk. So we'll see. We'll hope that if we do happen to come across any further tumor rats, that we will happen to find another antidote from them and then we can use that to, to heal Marduk. Or at least get rid of the poison. So we found a copper ring, and this tiny ring somehow raises defense by a whole point. So to that, it's actually a ring that will make us stronger defensively. And as for who ought to equip that ring, well, I don't know. Let's take a quick look at our gear here. We see we have cloth tunics that, well, they're stylish vomit green commoner tunics worn by commoners. They have precisely zero armor. This is our armor rating right here, the shield with a zero on it. That blue circle is our magic defense, and we have zero there as well because and these tunics are, are junk. And here, next to the sword, that is our damage on our weapon. And so we have Marduk using a stick, which is technically a sword. Just don't think about it too much. <laughs> it's a pretend sword, right? A large, sturdy stick found on the ground. No, it's a mighty hero's magic sword, of course. It's short and light enough to wield in one hand like a sword. And, oh, it does have, it actually does have some reactions. Okay, so let's look a little more closely at those then. There we see the attack damage and the critical strike chance. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, on the big stick that Dugan has, which is a large sturdy stick found on the... No, it's a Mighty Hero. Mighty Hero's magic sword, of course. This one is large enough for a child to wield in both hands like a great sword. So Dugan, again, much like he was when he was a Mighty Hero, is using big two-handed swords, whereas Marduk is using smaller one-handed swords. And likewise, we see some skills here, same kinds that Marduk has, and let's take a look more closely at oops, what those are, and we'll have to go to the, sc the skills screen to see that. And so let's start with Marduk, perhaps. And here, in the star, we see our active skills, or abilities, the strike skill that we've used at least on one occasion, which is that fierce attack deals more damage, but is less accurate. And what you see here, MP is how much magic points or mana points or other MPs, whatever you want to make that acronym stand for. Um, basically, how much mana it takes for us to use that skill. It's actually zero in this case. And AP is... I'm actually not sure if that is ever defined either, but basically what it means is that whenever we use a skill, we get one. And then once we reach the maximum amount here, then we permanently learn that skill. So basically, the only reason we are able to use Strike at this point in time is because we have the access to that ability coming from 
our stick. It has strike as one of the options there. And so right now you see we have one out of five, whereas if we use the strike five times while we're wielding the stick, we will permanently learn strike, and then we can swap out to a different weapon and we'll still have access to that skill. If we swap to a different weapon before we fill that meter by using the skill five times, that means that we will not have permanently learned that skill, and therefore, if we do switch over to a different weapon, we will not have the ability to continue to use that skill. So, that is an interesting way to incentivize us to use many different items in order to make sure that we permanently learn those skills. So we have Strike, we have Huff Puff, which is the healing ability that we have not yet needed to use, but it is, uh, taking a few deep breaths to regain your wind and carry on fighting. And then let's take a look at other reactions. So I was talking earlier about how we didn't have any, that is because I did not equip them. So if I press this button here, X, I can activate or deactivate this ability. So what we see is that if we activate it, it, take, it becomes green, this little indicator there. And then you'll notice that our RP down here, which stands for our reaction points, goes down from four when we have it unallocated to three when we do allocate it. And that means that basically there are only so many reactions that we can equip at any given point in time. So long term, we will find more reaction, both offensive and defensive abilities to use, and it will be up to us to decide which ones we want to keep, which ones we think are best. So in this case, we can activate this ability to give us additional one damage. Defensively, we have block, which subtracts a single point of damage from any physical attacks. Sure, let's activate that. These are magical attack and ma magical defense reactions. Unfortunately, we do not have any of those. And then passive skills would be abilities that you can have that are always doing something in the background. You don't actively need to press the reaction button to trigger them. They're going to be happening all the time which is very helpful. However, we do not have access to any of those at the moment. Dugan, we see, has the same strike and help puff skills on the active front. However, well, similarly, I should say, has the same plus one damage and minus one damage offensive and defensive reactions accordingly. So now let's head back, and Marduk is still poisoned. We have not yet found an antidote for him. Here is another Fumarat fight. We'll see how bad Marduk is looking. Still doing okay. We have the reaction bar showing up now because we do have some reactions activated at this point in time. I did, of course, miss that last one there. We could, however, or as well, take this opportunity to heal a little bit with Mardek using his Huff Puff ability, like we were talking about earlier. That is his heal. That gets 30 HP back, which is pretty sweet. So that counters much of the damage that he's already taken from that poison. Hugin, however, is not in as bad shape. So we'll use him offensively. However, he has now gotten poisoned as well. So both of our little heroes are looking a little worse for wear at the moment. We'll see if we can take out the Fumer Rats here. And hopefully, we'll be able to head back to the Save Crystal and heal up quite soon in order to make sure that we heal ourselves up before these guys get hurt a little too much by this poison here. So they're basically, they're taking one damage every time they each glow green like that to give you a sense as to how significant that that damage is. We're getting close here. We have made it. So there we go. A soothing light washes over you. Your wounds are healed. Would you like to save? Sure, let's save. And we'll head over this way. I do think we need maybe one more lead pipe. I had not been paying terribly close attention, but we've definitely picked up several at this point. And now that we have a lot more HP, we can certainly focus on attacking and not worry too much about the defenses. However, as soon as I say that, we get poisoned again. And continuing to get some experience here, and every time we gain a level, we will get a little bit more life, a little bit more MP, and we will also gain one reaction point on that page that we saw earlier where we were allocating our, our skills. And we, oh, we actually have two antidotes now. Okay, well, we probably did pick one up earlier and I did not realize it. Oh, and we have the, the copper ring that gives us one defense in the accessory slot. It is a ring, whereas, you know, it's obviously not a shield and it's not a helmet. 
So do we have a preference as to who we'd like to have equipping the Copper Ring? Dugan actually has slightly less life than Marduk. The reason for that is because his vitality stat is a little bit lower than Dugan's. Or rather, Dugan's is a little bit lower than Marduk's, I should say. And so I think for that reason, it makes sense to give Dugan a little bit more defensive ability, or defensive ear, to make sure that he can stay alive. And here is some antidotes, actually a lot of antidotes there. That was five. And so that is going to be very helpful for us. And let's take a look at our inventory to see if we actually do have five lead pipes. So we have acquired all the ones that Maridor was looking for us to get for him. And we have also unlocked all four of the chests in this area. So we have done that as well. So there shouldn't be much else for us in here. Let's head back to Maridor's house and turn in this quest. Did I find the, did you find the, the, the five lead pipes yet? Yes, we did. Great. I knew I could count on you. Now you're reward. What can I give you? Ah, I know. You can have this cog necklace. It's a little necklace I had magically enchanted to protect from sleep. So then I could work longer hours on my inventions. But the health problems outweigh the benefits. It'd be useful in the woods with all those pesky fun goblins around. Thanks! Now, shouldn't you boys be getting back to your big adventure? I've held you up enough for today. Okay. So, let's take a quick peek at what we got from Mariador there. And it is the Cog Necklace, a necklace with a simple gear attached. It was enchanted by Mariador to protect the wearer from being put to sleep. So skills, it gives Insomnia, which is one of the passive skills that we were referring to earlier. So it will not be something that requires that we use any reactions. It will just be happening all the time when we do have it uh, activated. And then it also has the property of allowing us to resist the sleep status effect. So sleep is similar to poison in the way that it is applied and that Whenever you're going into a battle, you might find yourself up against an opponent that has the ability to make you go to sleep. And that means that you will miss a turn, or several, depending on how long you're asleep for. And on this occasion, let's spread the love a little bit here. And we gave Dugan the Copper Ring for a little bit of extra defenses. Let's give Marduk the Cog Necklace to give him the ability to resist sleep. And we'll also go into the skills menu, go over to Marduk, and... Here you see we're in the passive skills area. We'll select Insomnia, which does take up four reaction points. And we have exactly four reaction points, so it works out well for us. And over the course of 20 battles, we will fully learn this ability and make it so that Marduk will no longer need to have this equipped in order to learn the Insomnia ability that grants immunity to sleep. And that would mean that even without wearing this necklace, Marduk would still be immune to sleep, which would be very helpful. Then we could, you know, pass over the necklace to Dugan, and we have two characters who are able to avoid getting the sleep status effect. So that's the idea there. But I think this is probably a good place for us to wrap up this video, and that means that next time we will be heading out into Soothwood and seeing if we can find that crash site. So I'm looking forward to it. Hope you guys are too, and I'll see you then.